I'm Yuka Kobayashi, lecturer in China International Politics. I'm Michelle Staggs Kelsall, senior lecturer in law and co-director of the Center for Human Rights Law. Hey, Yuka. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? Yeah, good. How are you? Not too bad, thanks. Should we just dive let's, right in? Let's get going. Okay. <laughs> what three things come to mind when considering our topic, human rights in a divided world? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we begin, Yuka? Where do we begin? I mean, for me, the three top things are eradication or poverty, genocide and big tech. So I think at the moment, um, one of the key things that's being you know, looked at is basically in various human rights contexts, like, for example, looking at the global north perception, global south, like, for example, what, you know, cl climate change is very much linked with, you know, how we actually ensure kind of a protected environment going forward. But, you know, developing countries really want to protect their right to develop and actually, you know, implement things piecemeal, whereas the global north really wants to do this quite quickly because they've already mm -hmm. gone through the trajectory. And so I think in that sense, global north and south is really encapsulates one dynamic and another dynamic is really the east-west division like looking at sort of like the western democratic states and also kind of the china rise and sort of this kind of authoritarian narratives is what you know is basically simplistically framed but i think there's more there but there are kind of cultural and civilizational differences between global east and west which i think is really putting a lot of challenges in human rights i think we have so much to learn at this point in time from uh, First Nations peoples mm. in addition to, as you say, understanding the divisions between East and West and North and South, and also the Global North in the, in the Global South and mm. the Global South yeah. in the Global mm. North, because yeah. of course economic disparities mm. in these states further divides the way in which populations and people understand human rights. With the rise of technology, how do human rights intersect with digital spaces? Oh, that's a really good question. I think um, with the advancements of technology, we've actually seen a lot of changes in the way we do things. Like, for example, even when we use mobile technology and digital platforms, we're using and transferring data. And what we do with data is a very difficult question linked with ethics and also how we preserve individual rights or the group rights of people and how we process data. So, you know, The Economist talks about data being the new oil, but I think in terms of what um, we're doing in terms of digital spaces, I think it's really testing the boundaries of how we ensure that individual human rights are protected. I fully agree with you, Yuka. I mean, I think that the point that you make about um, data being able to be collected and then bought and sold just completely changes the way we understand rights protection in the 21st mm. century. I mean, we're essentially living in a surveillance society, and that means that what was previously private and you know, part of the right to privacy mm. is now becoming increasingly public and, and used in ways that we don't even necessarily know about. So tech is, is both a boon, but also a threat, I think, in our current age. And as we see across the globe, tech can have really important um, effects on both uh, the democratic processes and elections, mm. in addition to the way in which um, co conflicts emerge and occur, such as the Rohingya genocide. In what ways do political divisions impact the protection of human rights within and between states? Mm, a big question. I mean, rights are in many respects inherently political, right? And there's a politics mm. of in international human rights law in itself and between states. States that have shared histories, um, common understandings of law, tend mm. to be states that align mm. on international issues. Not always, but often. And of course, we have a divide between the Global North and the Global South, um, traditionally in uh, international fora, that has meant um, that various uh, divisions have played out in that way with the group of 77 states, of course, mm. being a historic example of um, states push, pushing back against the great, the so-called great powers or mm. Western powers. But all of that being said, and with that history in mind, I think today the divisions uh, between states are becoming more complex and mm -hmm. there's um, gradations between those groups, mm. largely based on economic um, interests. Mm. And then within states, again, it's um, whether you see rights as the response to ensuring your civil liberties and mm. fighting against oppression in the streets. No, I couldn't have actually said more on the topic, except <laughs> I was going to say, sort of looking at the political 
divisions, I think you're actually seeing a very interesting ways in which, you know, um, governments are actually particularly talking about the Indo-Pacific these days. Like, for mm -hmm. example, the free and open Indo-Pacific is something that, you know, Japan, the United States, and all their allies are talking about, sort of ensuring that rule of law and human rights are ensured. Mm -hmm. In terms of basically how that translates into kind of, you know, interpretations and ways in which we think about human rights, it's kind of interesting ways in which, like, you know, geopolitical sort of divisions have really come into kind of the ways in which human rights are kind of discussed globally. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree with you. It's definitely part of the picture. <laughs>